Okay, so hello, it's Nikki Scott here from UK Hypopressives, and um, this evening on our live q and I am joined by Emma Broom. Emma is a UK Hypopressives senior trainer, and um, she's come to talk to us today all about, sorry, my dog's so <laughs> typical, don't work with children or animals. She's come to talk to us all about urinary incontinence amongst female athletes and um, surviving endometriosis in the workplace. So um, lots of hot topics there. Um, and hopefully there'll be lots of questions as we go along. If not, we've got a few little things we want to talk about anyway, so not to worry. So I'm going to hand you over to Emma to do a little brief introduction and um, we'll get started. So welcome, Emma. Right, thank you, Nikki. Hi, everyone. And um, yeah, so I'll start talking about um, yeah, uh, urinary stress incontinence um, with female athletes. And, and that's exactly how I came across um, hyperpressives back in 2018 now. So um, from the age I've, I've done gymnastics, literally on and off all my life since the age of uh -huh. um, two and a half. And I'm now 43. So a long time. Yeah. Wouldn't like to say I've ever been particularly good at it, but I still do it now. Um, I train between two and four times a week and um, I have the national competition um, up in Shropshire at the end of August. So it's a huge part of my life and um, I really, really enjoy it. Back when I was 22, I started suffering from um, urinary stress incontinence. And at the time, I mean, particularly when you're, you're that kind of age, it's so embarrassing. And, you know, day to day living, it was absolutely fine. But if I got on a trampoline and, you know, bounced a lot, you know, I, I leaked. And also um, when I was doing gymnastics, if I was doing tumbling, et cetera, I had the same impact. And I went to see my doctor. And at 22, he suggested an internal examination. And to be quite frank, I was really uncomfortable with that. And um, then I saw a female doctor. And at the time, she said, well, actually try in inserting a tampon. So I did. Yeah, seriously. Wow. I've not heard that one. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? It, it did help. Right. So I would only do it um, when I was, you know, at, at the gym. I wouldn't do it any other time for, you know, for that purpose. And it did help. But again, you know, with, you know, toxic, toxic shock syndrome and things, I wasn't comfortable doing it. And then um, I changed location and then work kind of took over more than me being able to do sports. So I kind of forgot about it for a bit. And then in my 30s, I started doing gymnastics again. And and the issue, obviously, was, was still there. Yeah. And I really didn't know what to do about it. And then I started competing. And, you know, every time you get on a trampoline and you, you basically you're wetting yourself, it's it's really, really embarrassing. So you're trying not to drink before you, you get on the trampoline. And then every time you get off a trampoline, you're going to the loo. And, and it was that, that constant cycle. So, yeah, by um, 2018, I was at my wit's end. And I was like, because Kegel exercises just weren't doing anything for me at all. I'd like to think I was doing it correctly, but I don't know because I didn't know about, you know, women's health physios at that point. I'd never heard of one. Nobody suggested to go and see one. And plus, it wasn't something I was declaring to the world either. I didn't want anyone to know. And, um, and that's how I found Nikki and came across UK hyperpressives. And because um, I was a... I was a personal trainer at that point I thought well it'd be really nice to you know qualify and be able to teach it to to other people and you can see over here that's actually a trampoline in my garden yeah. and um, yeah and it's, it's a pretty big one so I still do leak on a trampoline but only when I'm doing more extreme moves because the pressure um is is, is pretty phenomenal and you're putting um, when you're on a trampoline, you're putting 16 times your own body weight through your pelvic floor. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so it's uh, it's it's quite quite a lot. So as you can imagine, there are an awful lot. <laughs> Sorry, it's very distracting. 
<laughs> there's not much I can do about it really because it's the sofa and he's used to sitting on it <laughs> so just carry on he's fine he, he does it I'll, I'll shut his ears when he doesn't want to hear about oh, it <laughs> it looks adorable <laughs> and yeah so it's it's a huge unspoken problem not just with um you know women that do gymnastics and trampolining but any sport that's that's high impact so crossfit weight training bodybuilding volleyball netball rugby anything where you've got that leap and jump for example or with with crossfit um it's really uh prevalent when people are doing double unders which is where you do two rounds of a skipping rope um within one jump and when you're, you're doing box jumps and um i actually watched a video um on this it was from 2013 but it was fascinating because in in the international um crossfit i i don't do crossfit but within the international competitions it was perfectly acceptable for for women to to wet themselves yeah and it's almost like they felt that if they didn't then they hadn't worked hard enough absolutely and it was really sad because they actually interviewed a gynecology female gynecologist yeah, I've seen it. yeah. And, yeah. and she was saying oh well no it's it's fine if you know if you, if you want to be in the top then it's fine to leak and I'm thinking well well it's not no it really isn't um so it's an eye-opener but it's also really from my perspective it's really nice to know that I'm not alone because I haven't had kids and so for me from the age of 22 to you know be going on a, a trampoline and, and wetting myself and there's girls as young as as 13 who are suffering from stress incontinence doesn't surprise me. yeah because it's that it's that pressure management isn't it it's having a properly functioning body and eat and, and like a, a young girl of 13 isn't um, properly formed yet so she hasn't got that proper function anyway so mm. And, you know, that that could be that we say, oh, well, young, uh, the young body that isn't developed yet shouldn't be put under that much pressure. And that's probably the case. Mm -hmm. But there are obviously interventions like hypopressives that would help them with that pressure management. And that's what is missing is that it's not. I, I knew a young girl who was um, a powerlifter um, mm -hmm. and she was doing it from about the age of 15, 16. And she came to me at one point and said, it's great. How do I stop? How do I stop this? Because I'm I'm wetting myself, and I'm like, well, you know, you you're picking up really, you're small, you're picking up really heavy stuff, and you're not really designed to do that. Yes, mm. you've got the strength, you've got the ability, you've got the natural talent, but you um, aren't actually designed physically to be able to handle that much pressure. No, no, exactly, and it doesn't matter. Um, so, so the difference between, say, um, somebody that's classified as um, athletic incontinence from a, a you know normal it's not normal but you know yeah. everyday in, incontinence if you like is predominantly with um with female athletes they've either got um a um a hypertonic pelvic floor so it's kind of because they're they're kind of either sucking everything in or they're they're so toned that, that the pelvic floor can't actually relax enough so when you've got that internal pressure there's nowhere else for it to go because the pelvic floor is working as hard as it can already because it's doing it almost like 24 7 so for a lot of women it's a case of learning how to how to relax it but then you've also got another group of women who are athletes who would have more um more of a pelvic floor dysfunction as in their sport that they they're doing they've over exercised so it's actually stretched the ligaments and the, the fascial tissue and um and that's why they, they suffer and, from it. and then there's the uh athletes that are like gymnastic gymnastic type athletes who have hypermobility as well thrown into the mm -hmm. mix and we, we already know that with hypermobility um you know i talked to bonnie southgate about this um that's just a a, a population who are um setting themselves up for problems further afield, further along the line, once they've had children, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Or even if they choose not to have children and they, they're a sports person and they're hypermobile, then they are really at risk of things like prolapse. Yeah. 
So yeah, it's, um, it, I think that just generally incontinence, prolapse, all of the kind of things that fit under that pelvic floor dysfunction umbrella tend to be thought about in women that have had children. Mm. Great to kind of talk to you because it's, it's still massive. The, the, the highest prevalence of incontinence is with female athletes and postnatal women. Those mm. are the two highest percentages of urinary incontinence. So um, yeah, it's, it's, people don't think about it and they don't realize uh, what a benefit something like hyperpressives would be to help them with that pressure management. Yeah, totally. I mean, they were set, I, I read a, an article that said that um, in 2016, the entirety of the French gymnastics team suffered from some form of um, urinary incontinence. It's, it's crazy and 80% of um, female trampolinists yeah. suffer from it. But if you think you're putting, you know, 16 times your own body weight through yourself when you're impacting on that trampoline, it's, it's not. Would you do that within a session and the amount of sessions you do per day and then Absolutely. You know, per week, et cetera, yeah. Yeah. I mean, body. I mean, a good thing is there's two, um, two female trampolinists now um, who are Olympians, uh, Laura Gallagher-Cox and um, Izzy Songhurst, who've both suffered from this. And Izzy started suffering when she was 13. And they're actually openly talking about it because so many um, younger gymnasts and trampolinists feel that they're, they're totally alone. I, you know, I've, I've asked around in my club, I've asked the coaches and they're like, they know of a few because they've, they've got quite an open approach. So the girls are encouraged to, you know, tell them if, if they feel like it, if they've got, got any issues, so they can get support. And British Gymnastics do offer sort of like pelvic floor workshops, apparently, but I really want to try and get in there with, with hyperpressives. Absolutely. But of course, because of all the, um, yeah, the bad, bad press that gymnastics has got, you know, this, particularly this year, um, with the, oh, I've completely forgotten his name, um, Larry Nasser, who is the convicted champion yeah. in the US. So, you know, pe people, girls aren't going to want to talk about a problem like that. And no, I mean, it's hard enough for, for like postnatal women or menopausal women mm. to talk about it, let alone a young, young female athlete. It's, it's, um, it's yeah. A or something you want to be talking about you know you, you feel embarrassed about it enough exactly and and you do feel you're alone because even if you're you know your teammates are suffering from it it's not like you're going to you know in, in your 40s or when you've had kids you, you can open up and you can talk about things like that a bit more but in your teens and your early 20s you don't want to talk to anyone about that so I do think it's down to the governing bodies to actually you know shout about it and say you know what although it's not okay to have this we've got the tools to support you and the Welsh women's rugby team are, are currently doing that and they did a questionnaire to to you know for, for the team to find out if any of them have this issue and the majority of them did so they're now using I think it's um Evie the um yeah, yeah that. stimulation isn't it mm -hmm. yeah I mean not we're going part of the way there I just think that um uh, yeah, it's not really the, the, the full way there because that's not going to work for everyone, is it? No, no, it, it that's isn't. Working, that's working on the premise that your pelvic floor is weak and it isn't. It's not. It's just dysfunctional. It's it needs to get back that relationship with the with the diaphragm and and it needs to activate the deep core muscles and it needs to get everything kind of co-activating together. Whereas something like Evie is just kind of working on contract release in, in isolation isn't it and it's kind of yeah. not accepting the fact that it's your entire as you said it's your entire body it's your diaphragm it's your yeah, core you don't go as a rugby player and run on the pitch and just use your arms do you I mean, <laughs> just <laughs> your legs you use your whole body so your whole body needs to work together Absolutely. and that's you know that's where I think it falls down that whole oh let's give them a device or give them something that they can use to target the area that where the problem is yeah. but you know don't really work on the, the the whole body the body as a whole which is no you, you need a holistic approach and unfortunately a lot of people want a quick fix um i watched a, a program last night which i'll, I'll come into later and i talk about oh, the... i didn't watch that i couldn't bear it oh. <laughs> i i saw it and i was like no i need to stay away from that yeah no i decided to watch it 
Wow. And um, vasectional and endometriosis, there is a section on peri and, and menopause, wow. and also a section on um, urinary incontinence. Yeah. And they offered three three options. For, well, they had to, so three women tried these these three options, and they all had to do them for two weeks. One of them um, was a uh, pessary. Um, to offer bladder support. Oh yeah, it was Vicky. I totally agree. So annoying. So annoying. That's why I didn't watch it, Vicky, because I just I knew I'd get annoyed straight away. I it, it was. I, I I was watch. I was cringing while I was watching it with my head in my hands, and um, and then the other was, to be quite frank, it looked like a vibrator. Um, but again, it was um inserted. To, yeah. Absolutely to to check whether you're you're squeezing in the correct manner, and the final one. Was a pair of shorts, so it you gave you. In. Yeah, well, no, so it gave you electrical stimulation. Oh. So instead of actually doing, you know, the, the clench and squeeze, which is what they were suggesting, it was a you get you get electrical impulses going into your your bum cheeks and oh. thighs and stuff. And um, but you know, I mean, they're expensive. I think they were like two hundred and fifty quid or something like that. But they were all quick fix you know options and none of them are addressing the actual issue but it's you know <sighs> yes that's you, a, a pessary that's platforms, that's platforms, platforms, platforms like that are just an opportunity to sell you something I mean a, a pessary can be an amazing device for someone that has really severe symptoms especially with obviously something like a prolapse exactly. but um, then you go and see a gynecologist or your doctor to have those inserted these were ones where you buy five for 15 pounds over the counter brilliant. and you treat it in the same way as a tampon brilliant <laughs> right just give me one second everyone because my dog is driving me mad he's got running around in circles so i'm just going to get a water spray because that's the only thing that will stop him from doing that has anyone got any questions at the moment while um while Nikki's off sending the dog? Or did anyone else watch that program last night? Yeah, all right, he's just got. He's, it's quite nice. It's, it's very friendly water spray. I'm not being doing anything horrible, but he just he'll just continue to do that. He goes round and round and round in circles, knocking everything over, being a complete idiot when <laughs> he's lying down and just having a nice time. So. I've got that now. I've got my weapon of choice and I'll be spraying it every, every now and again when he's being silly. So did we have any questions about um, urinary incontinence at all? I think so. And it, urinary incontinence in general, not specifically, you know, about, and when I'm talking about athletes, I'm not just referring to elite athletes, anyone that does sport, anyone you know, yeah. if you're if you're jogging or or you're walking or you're trying to play with your kids and and you're you know you're you're having a leak, it's embarrassing, whatever it is. And and then you have ten a lady going, oh, it's an oops moment. Here, have a pad or a pair of knickers. And yeah, that's okay. You just you just spend you know ten ten quid a pack on these hideous um, pull ups for for adults that you probably need two or three in a day if you've got really bad incontinence. And so therefore mm -hmm. we're we're raking it in because if we can sell lots of these then um and it's just it i hate the adverts i hate the the way that the tv portrays women women doing yoga and going oh you know my pad i can't do that movement because my pad doesn't hold enough we and i'll really wee myself if i do that so i'll have mine mine's thin and it holds lots of we and it's like come on guys yeah this isn't something that we should be normalizing for women of that age or of any age really um it just gives it just it just gives the wrong message I think you know and it and it stops people from really understanding that there is stuff that they can do to help themselves and it isn't all about pelvic floor squeezes I just the more and more I, I talk to people the more, more inadequate I think that the, the the treatment that's being given to women currently it really is exactly. uh, and I'm not afraid to stand up and say that that really pelvic floor squeezes there's they're fine for some things but but they're given as that gold standard approach to any pelvic floor dysfunction and they're just not applicable in a lot of cases so. no exactly there's so many people where where it won't work because as you said if they've got a tight pelvic floor if they've got some other form of you know dis dysfunction it, it might work well for for some people who have a weak pelvic floor because they do need to strengthen it but then hyperpressis i personally feel is, is a much better solution because you're not putting that additional pressure 
no on, on your body and you're getting so many other benefits from it as well. And why would you just want to isolate your pelvic floor by just doing the clenching and the squeezing? Again, it's like, you know, I'm gonna do a bodybuilding competition, but I'm just gonna train arms. For arms, you know? yeah. And my arms would look great, but the rest of me wouldn't. So yeah, you know, it's really silly, it's a very silly way. Of yeah, it's it's just just infuriating. And I think the more we can we can stand up and say, you know, no, this is not acceptable. Yeah yeah it's not good enough you can't sweep it it's almost like it's being swept under the carpet it's like oh well you're suffering from this here's a pair of pants yeah and and just get on with it i read a really interesting fact that within the next um decade we, um femtech as they call it um is going to i think this year sales will go up to 40 billion wow it's, yeah. it's criminal really it's criminal that that you know you you just got to think of some crazy product that has a slightly positive effect on someone and there we go everyone's buying it and people are getting rich off of it when actually there's a very simple solution that just retrains your breathing and gets you gets you walking taller and in better posture and sorts out your pelvic floor most of the time exactly. I mean you know, I'm not saying it's the it's the cure for everything just the same as uh, pelvic floor squeezes on but it's it's um what you know when you've got things being given out like electrical stimulation or you know like, what, what was it you called it oh Fem Fem -tech. Fem -tech. brilliant Fem -tech. Yeah. Um, yeah it's just it's just very frustrating that that those can come to market but um it, it you know how hard it is to talk to oh someone about hypopressives and to get them to engage with it so yeah. it's uh, a sad fact that a lot of people want a, a quick fix solution as well and with hyperpressis of course you've got to put the time and the effort into it and if you if you don't do it yes your symptoms will come back but but once you've you've learned the technique it's yours for life and yes you can choose to have more sessions but you you don't have to you know with with a trainer whereas with your femtech i'm sure you know it's going to be like apple isn't it you've, you've got one version and then like another year another version will come out so then you'll want like to your exercise bike it's like all the equipment that everyone bought in lockdown and then now they're just selling it off for cheap on market yeah. <laughs> they're, they're hanging their washing off their exercise bike because uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time and then they'll just put it in the drawer you know this femtech they'll just put it in the drawer and forget about it, it didn't really work that well um, yeah, just, I think the thinking, it's hard to change it when people just want that, they just want a quick fix, they don't want to put the effort in, but I'm definitely, you know, for those of us that, that do do it regularly and do put the effort in, then it's just an amazing tool to have, really. Absolutely, it's life changing. As I said, if, you know, if I'm doing particularly severe moves on the trampoline, yes. I do still have issues, but for normal, you know, I can get on trampoline in my garden, I can jump, I can, you know, do backdrops and all sorts. I have no issues whatsoever, which I used to. Yeah, some salts, and oddly, I do front some salts, it's fine. Back some salts, not so much. So I haven't quite <laughs> worked out my habits. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, are you have you got a campaign for this? Are you, are you doing anything to raise awareness? I'm trying to with um, with British Gymnastics. As I said, they they do have um, like sort of pelvic floor workshops and things. So I'm just trying to like sneak my way yeah. in in a little bit more, um, only because that's my area of of knowledge from the sport. Yeah. But I yeah, I just really want to let people know that. Leaking, although leaking isn't okay, that they're not alone. No. And so I'm going to start off, you know, get get in with BG and see if I can attend some of their workshops and offer a solution there, but also do it on the local grassroots level yeah. at the moment as well. So, so we've got a question: Is there a limited age to starting hypopressives? I have a 13 year old dancer patient having lots of leaking issues. So, I mean, what I would say to that really, and do you mind if I answer that? No, not at all. Is that they can start whenever, and there isn't a limited age really. They're mostly limited by um, how much they're willing to engage with it and how much, they're, how much time they're willing to put into it. So I suppose you would, um, if you were give, giving them hyperpressives as stuff to do, you would just make sure that they did very short sessions, but did them consistently and regularly. 
alongside maybe building it into if they're a dancer building it into kind of like their warm-up or their cool down routine so something where it doesn't feel like something extra to do um but I mean it can be brought in at any age it's just that obviously children find it really hard to kind of concentrate and engage anything uh, with anything especially boys um I think it's probably easier with girls um because they just mature um a mm. lot more quickly but um yeah so that that would be my take on it you, is, is there anything you'd like to add to that really no I I'd absolutely agree with you Nikki um there's um a, a friend's a friend's daughter who is a gymnast who was suffering I I had to had to chat with my friend and at the time she thought although I said you know it's absolutely fine to for her to do hyperpressives she knew her daughter's concentration span yeah just wasn't quite enough that's, that's it really isn't it mm. yeah and it may just be that you just start them off with better breathing and and kind of focus on that and focus the breathing I know uh Rich uh tried it when his son was fairly young and sort of and he's still using it really as part of his it's more to kind of settle his nerves now mm -hmm. but he's using the lateral breathing to kind of settle his nerves on the start line and um you know before a race really so yeah, I mean, just bring it in, slide it in wherever you can so that they don't really notice it too much. And it's yeah. almost like part of making them a better dancer. That's how you have to kind of sell it, really. <laughs> exactly. And if they've got, if they're doing their grades or their exams or they've got competitions, as Nikki said, just introducing the lateral breathing yeah. is absolutely brilliant. It, now, I've recently started with um, all of my new clients. I actually do like a, um, a mental health questionnaire. Oh, yeah. um, when they start with me and then um, do it again at the end, just to see what kind of difference it's made to things like um, stress, anxiety, sleeping, um, and, and obviously, you know, with prolapses and things, because that can cause stress and anxiety too, so of course. So whether that's had a, a calming impact as well, I think it's, it's just such a fantastic Well, there's tool. just such a broad spectrum of things it mm. can do with. Um, why would you not use it <laughs> well, exactly we've just got to make sure that we continue to shout and uh yeah 100 percent. yeah right so do you want to talk about your other subject today which is um surviving endometriosis in the workplace oh yes 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 <laughs> so, so not surprisingly endometriosis is also something um i i suffer with yeah. and um i'm sure um, most people know endometriosis has been in the news a lot this year and um, there was a parliamentary debate about it on the 9th of February which was led by um, Alec Shelbrook who's actually a male MP mm -hmm. and it's 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 interesting um, because as I watched the debate and uh, and he's, he said, why does it take a man to talk about endometriosis? Why, why, you know, why could you not have a, a woman talking about it? Mm -hmm. And, and you could, but you just get shot down. It took me 10 years to be diagnosed with it. So again, I started getting symptoms around the age of, of 22. And I didn't get diagnosed with it until I was 32. And that's, I was working over in America at that point. And I think if I'd been in the UK, I still probably, you know, would have been undiagnosed. And, you know, I was in chronic pain. And at one point, my, my period was so heavy, I thought I'd had a miscarriage. Wow. Because it, it was just, it was horrendous. But I just kept being fogged off and kept being told it was IBS. And, um, Exactly. And so in 2013, I had a, a laparoscopy and um, they're like, yes, you, you've got endometriosis. And um, so with this, um, just, oh, just in case people don't know what endometriosis is, it's probably helpful if I explain. So um, it, this is a very crude way of explaining it because I can't actually remember everything at the moment. Because I've also had long COVID just for fun. So I'm still having a little bit of brain fog. I'm uh, really yeah, over about that. Yeah, seven and a half months, and I'm I'm pretty much over it now. Right. Um, but yeah, that was not right. as you know, Nikki. Um, 
Yes, so, so with endometriosis, um, obviously on, on a monthly basis, um, your uh, uterus basically sheds its lining and you have your period. With endometriosis, um, the endometrium cells can grow on the outside um, of your uterus. So it's, and it's still blood. So the, each month it's got nowhere to go. So I've got this great um, quote here, which I'll read from a lady called um, Heather Gwidden, who is a program director um, at the Center of Endometriosis Care. And she basically puts it, she says, it's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. And it's a, to basically, you know, give you an idea of what it is. It's systematic inflammatory disease characterized by the presence of endometrial-like tissue found outside of the uterus. Endometriosis has significantly negative impacts on the physical, emotional, reproductive and sexual health, financial security, relationships, careers and schooling of those affected. It's commonly located in the abdominal pelvic region, um, but the disease has also been found um, in virtually every organ system in the body, including the lungs. Wow, I didn't know. Yeah. It's, and I mean, I've got what's called deep infiltrating endometriosis. So um, I've got it um, on my ovaries, but I've also got it on my bowel and possibly on my bladder and the pouch of Douglas as well, which is, you know, quite exciting. So my consultant locally to me was like, if you need to have an operation, I can't actually deal with it. So I'm now under um, UCLH in London, which is where the National Endometriosis Centre is. So if I do need an operation, um, they would have the, the, you know, the gynecologist, a bladder surgeon and a bowel surgeon on hand as well. So yeah, it's, it's horrendous and it's mistakenly referred um, by some people as just painful periods and um, symptoms are not always limited to menstruation and can become chronic over time. Um, so I'm fortunate, not really, I'm fortunate, but not fortunate. <laughs> So um, you, you, you can you refer to them as as flare ups. And for me, um, I only get them uh, sort of like one day before my period and then one or two days during and back in well, it was only last year. The pain was just so excruciating. Um, I was curled up in a ball on the floor in our bathroom at 1.15 in the morning because I just did not know what to do with myself. So I can totally understand, as if this may sound drastic, but when women who have endometriosis, and unlike me, they have it continuously through the month, because some people do, that, you know, they, they want to end their lives, I get that. Mm -hmm. Because that pain that I felt was just unbearable. I had it in, so imagine, um, for me, this is how it feels. You know, if you get cramp in your your calf yeah, or your yeah. foot, yeah, and it's it's severe and it's sharp and it, it yeah, that's how I have it. But for about forty eight hours continuously, and there's nothing that they can. Give no, no, no absolutely. I mean, you, you could, the options are um, surgery, which would be um, a laparoscopy or um, a hysterectomy. And then there's another form of laparoscopy as well, which I can't remember the name of, which is the gold standard. So it's not very helpful, I'm afraid. Um, medication. We can add that bit in later, don't worry. Um, medication. Um, the marina coil, that's um, another option, um, which is a hormonal coil, which I'm not, I, don't, I just, to be fair, I don't want to take it. So what, um, what, what? Why is why would they use the marina coil for it? Why would that be effective? Is it the hormones in it? It's the hormones in it. So um, yeah, I've I've got a few friends actually who have endometriosis, and they found that the marina coil has really helped them. Um, but I've got um, I sound like a broken person. I've got other health issues, which means I don't really want to take more medication, no. put more things into my body. So. Yeah, last year I was I was at my my wit's end and I thought, well, maybe, maybe I can control it by by diet. So endometriosis is it's basically it's an inflammatory disease. Mm. Um, and we know, for example, that that sugar um, is inflammatory. 
Yeah. So uh, among other things, I, I, I cut out sugar. And then I did, um, basically, I did a gut reset and I took various different um, supplements over a four week period and um, and cut out. I mean, I literally lived on fresh air. I cut out um, caffeine, alcohol, dairy, wow. gluten. What a joyless life. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I did it for um, four weeks and it it stopped. Yeah. My pain and so I went from writhing around the floor in agony and not being like literally could not get out of bed it was yeah. awful to being able to you know function as a normal human being without I, I didn't have any pain for probably about six months and then it started to to creep back in and so I did the reset again in January um and now I'm, I'm pain free and yeah I, I don't I don't eat fresh air all the time I only do it for about four weeks and then I, I still eat pretty healthily but um I I eat I do eat gluten I eat a little bit of dairy um I don't generally eat red meat because I'm just not that keen on it um and occasionally I'll have sugar but well refined sugar um fruit and stuff I, I, I do eat but it makes it makes a difference but again it's it's the awareness thing um so going back on to um, the MP, Alec, he was saying that in the UK, it would take 20 days, 24 hours a day to save the name of every single woman in the UK that has endometriosis. Wow. And I mean, statistically, that's actually um, 1.5 million in the UK. Globally, 176 million women have endometriosis and you're like why on earth is it not spoken about why on earth do we have to go into the workplace and 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 suffer and be belittled and be told that oh you know what you're just having heavy periods it's like well no it's not just a heavy period at all not even remotely and um and you know it's great that it, it, okay, it was on that slightly odd program last night, but they did at least talk about it. It is at least being spoken about. And Emma Barnett, who's one of the presenters, she does Women's Hour on Radio 4. She has endometriosis, so she talks about it a lot. And there's some really great, you know, support, um, you know, support options out there with charities. But um, this, in the UK, they now have what are called um, endometriosis-friendly com um, companies but there are only 112 of those in the UK are recognised as being companies that will support women when, you know, when they're having a flare up, yeah. um, which, which is great, but it's still not, not that many. I mean, you've got, you've got some big, big companies out there, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Lillette's, which let's be honest, you'd hope Lillette's would to support that. Uh, Santander is another one, um, the Met Police. There's quite a few um, uh, sort of like county um, constabularies that, that do support that. Interestingly, not much in the NHS. Really? Mm. Yeah. yeah, which is, uh, which is what, what, what intrigues me is that what has made the MP want to kind of back this and be his campaign why why well um he's um i think he has a lot of constituents that have endometriosis he's so he's it and it's yeah yeah, yeah. He's, he's picked up the baton and and run with it and he's like i might be a man but i represent my constituents and i don't care whether my constituents are male or female they are my constituents and if this is an issue that's important to them then i'm going to going to fight for it so this um, debate they had in um, February, it, the, sort of the, the outcome was that yes, there should be more um, support in the workplace, of course. Yeah. And now it's just a case of, I guess, them going back and, and kind of working through it. Yeah. Um, but, but, but it is challenging because you do need to go to the bathroom a lot more. And, and if, for example, you're working um, in a call center, you're targeted on how many, yeah. you know, telephone, you know, how many calls you're you're picking up. And if you need to go to the loo, you know, two or three times in an hour, which isn't unusual with endo, 
um, your target's going to be down and you, you could end up being, you know, sort of sidelined or, or even di dismissed. And it's not like there's a union, really, <laughs> for, for people with, um, with endometriosis. So surviving it in the workplace I think is about being um, open and honest with your em employers, and you may you may not get any support whatsoever. But it's, it's but you may if you find if one in ten women suffer from it, you are not going to be the only person in your entire workplace that's that's having issues. So, providing we can be more open and have these conversations, you 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 know, it may be possible to get, get the support there and, and talk, yeah, when I said talk, talk to them. They, they may be able to help, they, they may not. Um, but I think having the open conversations will, will definitely help. But, um, and also sharing information um, about what you're going through um, and the pain and then just providing information about endometriosis in general. Because I mean, when I first, got diagnosed I was like endo you what now I know yeah, I mean again I, I've known people that I've been friends with that have had it but not really fully understood I don't think how mm. extreme it can be it's, it's a little bit like anything really is if you don't suffer from it you don't ever really and or you don't have someone close to you that suffers from it you don't ever really kind of think about researching it or, or no. find out about it because it doesn't affect you or anyone around you and I suppose with big companies, it's just about knowing it's out there and knowing that there's probably a percentage of their workforce that are going to be suffering from it. Exactly. And it's trying to be supportive. And I mean, to be fair, one of the good things about COVID is it introduced flexible working and people being able to work from home. So it might be an option to discuss with your line manager working from home you know, at times when you're likely to to get a flare up, so you can be close to to a bathroom and not be, you know, criticised for for going. And um, I mean that that would be a huge huge help for people as well. And um, yeah, just look at looking for support. So not necessarily just in work, but friends, family. I mean, I belong to um, North Essex. Um, endometriosis support group on Facebook so everyone in there is going through similar things to to you I would never say exactly the same because everyone has different symptoms which is why in the UK and a lot of other countries endometriosis is not classified as a disability because it impacts women in different ways endometriosis is graded um, from one to four I think um, and you could be a grade four, which is severe, but you may not have any pain whatsoever. Whereas you could be a grade one, hardly have any actual endometriosis, but have severe pain. So it's, it's very, very difficult yeah. to, um, you know, to, to say, oh, it's, it's endometriosis, therefore it's, it's a disability. Although recently France, um, I think it was this year actually, recognised endometriosis as a long-term disease which is, you know, it's, it's a, a step, in, step in the right direction. It's just having that acknowledgement more than anything. Right. You kind of talked about things like working from home, but then you've got <coughs> people like, I mean, the profession that I used to do before I was um, in fitness, which was a hairdresser. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we just we didn't get any breaks. I was, just, I was just kind of imagining the scenario you're talking about with yourself, like how that would have affected me because I was literally on my feet from eight o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. and you know could dash down the road and grab a drink and a, and a sandwich and eat it out the back and that was it yeah it was that it was that full on so you know if you've got that sort of situation where you can't work from home you can't have flex flexible working then there has to be something for people so at, at, at the moment unfortunately it's it's literally um the medication or the surgery i mean because as well as teaching hyperpressives my other role um i work as a chef on a super yacht and and this was a thing that got me um going down down the dietary path because again like you Nikki with your, your hairdressing when you're working on a yacht you are on the, that yacht 
and you are not able to take any breaks, you're doing 17 hour days, you can't just pop off to the bathroom and, and do what you need to do. And my stress and my anxiety around that was building up a lot because I was like how am I going to get through an entire season with with severe pain which when I'm at home leaves me in bed for two days yeah, yeah. and um, for me I was very fortunate that the, the diet and the supplements has worked and I'm still under UCLH and they call me every six months and they say how are you doing is your diet still working and I'm like yes and they're like would you like me to call you again in another six months? And I'm like, yes, please. So it keeps me within the system, um, but I'm managing it myself because you, you can have your operation as I did and it grows back, yeah. which it did for me. So you, you, you're stuck in this, this system because it is no cure for it. So it's just looking at the ways that are best to manage it for you. And it is going to be different for, for each in, individual. So do you have clients that come to you kind of more specifically for the nutritional side of it and endometriosis? Or is that something that you're, you're, you're wanting to? That's something I, I'd, like, I'd like to do because again, the hyperpressis has really helped with, with my endometriosis as well, because you've, you've kind of got that, that's that supports within your body so I don't want to say by strengthening your pelvic it's, it's never going to get rid of your, your endometrial I suppose that it, it very much has that effect of the um, of releasing tension and mm. the feeling of uncomfortableness that you get from that build-up by, yeah. by that by the myofascial work that it does the deep yeah. myofascial work that it does yeah, I just wondered if you had any other clients that that you were helping nutritionally with kind of what you were talking about. It's very interesting. I mean, I know you said it sounds like you were living on fresh air, but I'm sure you were eating stuff. But it just shows you how the power of good medicinal nutrition can really, really help you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, Personally, I'd much rather go down that route every single time yeah. than, than take take medication because the medication that they give you for endometriosis is strong it's you, you're taking NSAIDs and uh, which is um non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs um and it, you read the instructions and it's it gives you a list of things that you can't take it with but it also says oh you need to start taking this three days before your period and I'm like well, that's lovely if I knew which day my period was going to come on every single month. Yeah. But like most women, I don't. It's reasonably consistent, but, you know. And, uh, yeah, personally, it's it's not a route I want to go down. And if I can maintain it by diet and, and you know, every six, seven months supplements, then then I will. Um, because it allows me to, to live my life as as I want to to live it and I couldn't bear the thought of continuing being curled up on the floor so how are you finding your symptoms now you just kind of manage it through if they start to if they start to build up you go back yeah. to that kind of nutritional supplementary protocol so I try to eat pretty healthily um throughout the month I I make I make exceptions if there's parties and things because at the end of the day you you've you've got to enjoy yourself as well and I find if I'm eating too strictly I'll crave something more yeah and, yeah. and that makes that makes it worse and I do find if I've had a month where I've had more refined sugar for example yeah my symptoms are worse yeah and then and but even at the moment even if I do get the pain as I said for me the pain I don't get much pain in my pelvis actually it's predominantly in my legs oh. um yeah, which, which again, it's, it's quite common. It starts off in my thighs, sort of, you know, a day or two before my period, and then then eventually it goes into my pelvis. But oddly, I can cope with the pelvic pain more than I can cope with the leg pain, because it's that leg pain, which is like that severe, continuous cramp. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I can manage it with just a couple of paracetamol, which I'm, I'm really grateful for. And I do think exercise yeah. um, contributes. And, and and the hyperpressives and I do hyperpressives daily yeah. and uh, and it is that that relaxation and and the 
you know the sort of softening of your pelvic floor almost and as you said that um that fascial release deep inside as well because with endometriosis it causes a lot of scarring as well particularly when you've had the operation so with a laparoscopy they go in basically just above each hip bone and um in through your your navel and it leaves tiny tiny scars on the outside but on the inside you've got all these layers and layers of scar tissue which is kind of going like that and and locking itself together so um yeah hyperpressives can internally yeah. help relief that yeah wow you've really been through the mill <laughs> <laughs> I've got huge respect for you I did anyway but I do I've got a bit of respect for you now <laughs> but you know I mean it's important to me to be able to to talk about it and I'm not shy about telling people that I have endometriosis I was when I was first diagnosed because I didn't really understand it yeah and we've won it you know one in 10 women having it that's I mean that's a huge amount really it's so common and so the fact that there isn't that much support in the workplace and and it's great that these 112 companies are supposedly you know endo friendly but but what exactly does that mean because there's a sort of guideline um but there's nothing to say that they they have to follow it yeah. and they can have an endometriosis champion um, if they like and they say that doesn't have to be somebody that's got endometriosis it just has to be somebody that's interested in learning about it and, and being supportive and that's that's great but then you have to look at the question is are they just ticking boxes um to you know to make themselves look like a better employer or are they actually you know following through and really being supportive now because I work on yachts and have my own business and wasn't diagnosed when I was in the corporate world. Um, I don't. I don't know. No, uh, that's it. How true that is. But I'd be interested if anyone has had any experiences with that. Um, it's about yeah. kind of um, you, you. You become part of a Facebook group. But do you know of any other support groups that there are for people if that you know that you can suggest? Yes. I mean, the main one is um, endometriosis hyphen uk dot org. That's the main charity um, within the UK, and they are absolutely brilliant. Um, the majority of times I use them is going online, and there's, there's, you know, there's so much information there. But again, when I first got diagnosed, they have nurses that you can phone up and you can just have a chat with somebody because, you know, when you're told, well, yeah, it might leave you infertile, you'll probably have to have at least, you know, a minimum of one operation during your life you might have to have a full hysterectomy it's it's pretty scary and and they can't actually 100% find out that you've got endometriosis unless they do a laparoscopy no. so um yeah so that would be the main one that you that would, would be the main one definitely and, and they are absolutely brilliant but then I mean there's there's loads of um support groups on Facebook there's uh if you I mean if you just search endometriosis support groups within Facebook you'll definitely be able to find some um, within your local area and um, on Instagram uh, there's loads of people if you do hashtag endo warrior okay. I mean some people end up having to you know if they've had um, uh, endometriosis on the, the bowel for example um, they can end up having to have a bag attached to them for the rest of their lives yeah, which is which is absolutely horrendous, which is why the, the hashtag endo warrior yeah. um sticks because I think most most women who have it of any form of endometriosis, it's, it's yeah, it's it's not just the physical, it's it's the mental side. Yeah. It's 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 really hard, really hard. Yeah, I mean, like I say, it's something that I didn't know an awful lot about. So it's been good to kind of have you on here to talk about it, really, um, and bring some awareness for it. So we are starting to run out of time now. So what I was going to do was just see whether there was there was there's no hands up and there's nothing in the chat box at the moment. <laughs> um, we have actually gone through most of what we've written out anyway. Yeah. You've kind of covered what you had Um so yeah, I mean, has anybody got any questions that they particularly want to ask Emma before we go? 
nothing coming up in the chat box. Thank Emma, you. Um, it's been absolutely lovely to have you here talking to us today about um, two really hot topics, um, two things that are really, really important. And um, how can people get in touch with you if they want a bit more information from you, if they wanted to, um, you know, come and do some, mm. some work with you? So I am um, hyperpressivesessex.co.uk and also lifeacrobat.co.uk. On um, Instagram, I'm life underscore acrobat. I'm also on Facebook as, as life underscore acrobat acrobat and hyperpressive essex and i've just started on instagram mrs p the p lady because my married name is print and so my, my husband was like oh you can be mrs p the p lady so <laughs> i saw that i thought that's brilliant <laughs> let's talk about p <laughs> yeah let's talk about p <laughs> it's important it is important Right, so on that note, I'm going to uh, leave you there. Hopefully everyone that's watched it and everyone that's watching on the, on the catch up recording um, has enjoyed the subject. And if you need to, please do get in touch with Emma. Um, and that's it for this evening. Thank you very much. I am gonna stop recording. Yeah.